Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle, AKA Stitcherista here on YouTube. And today is Wednesday, January 31st. And this is going to be a whip and chat. And I'm gonna do uh, probably two true crime stories. I know it's been a hot minute since I've done that, but I am off the rest of this week and I have to sit and rest my foot. So I was like, why not do some videos and do some diamond painting and read some true crime stories? So to give you an update on my foot, I had an appointment today with my podiatrist and they took um, more x-rays and he suggested he put me in a boot. Yay. <laughs> and he wants me to get an MRI. He said, because an MRI is going to tell much more than an x-ray will, because he said I could have a hairline fracture, a torn ligament, or even what's called turf toe, which is a injury to the big toe joint in a nutshell if you want to read more about it just search turf toe on uh google and so bill took off work again today he has been a real trooper like he has really been taking care of me and making dinner and cleaning up and doing laundry and all the things you know you don't realize like I knew I did a lot around here, but you don't realize how much until you're limited with walking. And I mean, we have a split foyer. So we have stairs in the middle of our house that to get anywhere, you got to go up and down them. So I am hobbling around now with a boot on my foot. And my podiatrist suggested I ordered this thing called Even Up because the boot obviously is raising you up on that one side. He said, if you don't get something that raises your other shoe. He said you could have hip or back problems. Yeah, let's not add to the issues. So that was like 35 bucks on Amazon. So I ordered that and that should be here today. But yeah, the doctor was very quick. I like him. He's very thorough. He'll sit there and talk to you as long as you want to. He really listens. Like that's really important. So but yeah, so I have to go get an MRI next Friday at 8 a.m. When I got home, I let my boss know what was going on. And she knows what it's like to wear a boot. She broke her foot a couple months ago and was in a boot for a long time. So she's like, oh, I don't envy the boot. But if it's going to give me relief and help, you know, heal my foot, luckily working at home, I don't have to drive to work. And I can sit. Do you know what I mean? So that that is fortunate right there. So I have been icing my foot periodically and then also uh, doing Epsom salt baths at night before I go to bed, which seems to me to help it. So he said, keep the boot on unless you are showering or sleeping. So I am right now sitting in my recliner with my feet up. Yeah. So not thrilled, but it is what it is. God provides. It's in a plan. Thank you to everyone who good thoughts and prayers and all of that. Very much appreciated. And like I said, I'm very thankful that this happened on a week where I don't have to sit at my computer, you know, for eight hours a day. So I thought, why not do some videos this week? I'm sitting here doing nothing anyway. So my plan is to do a video today, tomorrow, Friday, true crime story time, because why not? So you can see I'm working on poinsettia pixie. I'm almost done this diamond painting. I actually am really looking forward to getting to a different diamond painting. I'm looking forward to using the mesh ruler again. And in the description box of this video and my video from yesterday, I linked Donnie's video where she shows you how to measure to see which mesh ruler you need to use for your diamond painting. So I am going to do that before I start working on Twilight Rose because that's the next one I'm going to work on. And I also, I think today too, I mean, it's only like 12.30 p.m. here when I'm recording this. I think I'm going to try to finish, do some stitching today and finish the Warm Winter Wishes because I only literally have one motif left to do and I'm done that piece. And then I think I'm going to work on the Valentine Quaker from Primrose Cottage Stitches. I feel like it's been so long, like it's taken me so long to do that piece. And let me see. I don't know how long it's actually taken me. When did I start that piece? Okay, yeah. I started that piece on January 1st. So if I finish it today, 
it will have taken me a full month to do something that small. You know, even stuff, even small stuff for cross stitch takes a while. Takes me a while. I know that. Seems to take me a while. But like I said, it's not a race. Um, but I will look forward to getting to something else. And another diamond painting. Okay. So, um, yesterday I finished watching the third season of Rock of Love, the Brett Michaels show, which I've seen it a number of times. Every couple of months I'll watch it again because it's something that I can fall asleep to and it's highly entertaining. It's such a train wreck. Um, but yeah, so I, I watched, finished watching that last night and yeah. All right. So let's get into these true crime stories. So I have sort of previewed them because I don't like reading stories that involve children being murdered or injured. Um, and I know that some of you don't like hearing that too. So these next two that I'm going to read don't involve children, at least not directly. Okay, so the first one is Kirsten Stevens. Charlie Stevens had lived a good life, a life of hard work and diligent investment. At age 54, he was living in a beautiful mortgage-free home in Independence, Missouri, with enough put away for a comfortable retirement. Good on Charlie, for sure. At that time, he had been married for four years and was in a loving union. He had also raised two sons from a previous marriage. Friends and co-workers knew him to be a caring, easygoing type, the kind of man who would willingly lend a hand to anyone in need. Sounds like Bill, right? He definitely is like that. But in March of 2004, a whirlwind blew into Charlie's life. It came in the form of a blonde bombshell named Kirsten, a new employee at the company where Charlie worked. Kirsten was 14 years younger than Charlie, yet she made no secret of the fact that she was interested in him. Perhaps flattered by the attentions of an attractive younger woman, Charlie allowed himself to be led astray. No, Charlie, sir, no. The man who could always be relied upon to do the right thing was suddenly involved in a torrid extramarital affair. Within a year, he had divorced his wife and marched Kirsten down the aisle. Wow. Then he stunned friends and family with another out-of-character move. He announced that he was taking early retirement. So 54, that means Kirsten is 40. You know, it's frightening to see somebody, a, a guy being able to be turned on his head basically by a woman that quickly. It's frightening, right? It truly is. Charlie could certainly afford to call time on his working career. Between his company pension and his savings, he was worth over $1 million. With no mortgage or other significant debt, the money was more than enough to see him through. Charlie was a man inclined towards frugal living. He certainly wasn't a spendthrift. But the same could not be said for his new bride. Now, you have to wonder, before I continue reading, you have to wonder if she knew he had money. She probably did. She probably did. He probably, when you're telling your other person about yourself, he probably mentioned all that. Kirsten never saw a price tag that she regarded as excessive, especially when someone else was footing the bill. She also had a love of slot machines and could be found every night of the week at the Ameristar Casino, the Isle of Capri, the Argosy, or Harrah's. Usually she would burn through every spare cent she had. Now she had a new source of funding, a doting husband willing to indulge her every whim. So you're married to him and you're spending every night at the casino. What is he saying about that? Because let me tell you, Bill and I like to go to the casino too, but if I was going every night, he would have a problem. We would have a problem. And indulge she did, burning through a fortune over the years that followed, running up losses that ate up most of Charlie's nest egg. Eventually, Charlie was forced out of retirement and into a sales clerk job at a local hardware store. Ma'am. Sir, no. Are you kidding me right now? 
I can't, all I can say is that China must have been good if you are getting my drift. Um, wow. This paid the bills, but only barely. Soon, Charlie had fallen significantly behind in his taxes and was forced into a painful decision. His only remaining asset was his home. Much as he loved the place, he would have to put it on the market to fulfill his obligation to the government. And where was Kirsten during this time of crisis? Kirsten was doing what Kirsten did best, looking out for number one. Kirsten had a new lover? Get out of here. What is wrong with people? Kirsten. And she was desperately casting around for a way out of her marriage and out of her financial predicament. The solution came to her while rummaging through her husband's desk one day. Ma'am. It was a million-dollar life policy listing her as the sole beneficiary. From that moment on, Charlie Stevens was in serious peril. I have always said the number two top reasons that people kill each other, spouses, money is number one, love is number two. Absolutely. Money. Kirsten was hardly discreet in her plans to murder her husband. (laughs) Kirsten sounds really stupid. Just saying. To friends, she would often casually mention that he was worth more to her dead than alive. Were her friends also his friends? Because why would you go around spouting that? I'm telling you, if you were going to murder your spouse, shut your friggin' yap. Be quiet. You don't go blabbing it everywhere. She was also doing research in a way that was guaranteed to leave a trail. Incognito tabs, miss. Ma'am. Her internet searches during this time were peppered with phrases like how to kill your husband, how to get away with murder, and how to cut brake lines. Are you? (laughs) I love it. Are you really that stupid? Obviously, yeah. In late 2013, Charlie eventually found a buyer for his South Jones Road property, and the couple started making plans to move to a rented apartment. However, there was a holdup in the transfer of the deeds, buying them a respite. It wasn't until the afternoon of March 7, 2014, that the new owner showed up to inspect the home. Kirsten was initially reluctant to let the man in, but eventually relented and gave him a brief tour. That excursion took them into the master bedroom where Charlie was asleep. Oh, don't mind him, Kirsten informed the buyer. That's just my daddy. He's always tired these days. What? That's my daddy. Shortly thereafter, the buyer departed, but not before reminding Kirsten that she had to be out within the week. At around 7 p.m. that evening, the Stevens neighbor, Virgil Bybee, was surprised by the sound of screams outside his house and someone pounding on his front door. Bybee opened up to find a distraught woman whom he recognized as Kirsten on his porch. They shot him, she wailed. They shot Charlie. The concerned neighbor ushered her inside and called 911. To the police officers who responded to the call, this was a confusing crime scene. Charlie Stevens lay on his bed covered by a blood-stained sheet. He had been shot four times, apparently while he slept. The shooter had then ransacked the house, emptying drawers and overturning furniture. It looked to the inexpert eye like a murder committed during a burglary. Hmm. But to an experienced police officer, the scene set alarm bells jangling. Any detective will tell you that burglars seldom carry weapons. Those who do are disinclined to use them unless faced with a direct threat. What threat did a sleeping man represent that would necessitate four shots being fired? Investigators are also well-versed in the modus operandi of housebreakers. They target specific high-value items and rarely toss the place. That kind of thing only happens in the movies. It also seemed odd that this particular burglar had left empty-handed after the considerable effort he had expended. The distraught widow could not name a single item that was missing from the house. This led investigators to a more probable scenario, a murder staged to look like a robbery gone wrong. 
The most likely suspect, as is always in such cases, was the spouse. You are number one suspect when your spouse dies, especially in your home. Have these people never watched true crime stories? Ever? Never, ever, ever? But Kirsten had an alibi. She claimed that she had been running errands all afternoon and had stopped in at a local casino to play some slots on her way home. It was on her return to the house that she discovered her husband's body. Since she had been on the other side of town at the time of the shooting, she could not possibly be responsible. Unfortunately for Kirsten, this was the worst possible alibi for her to choose. Casinos are among the most surveilled premises on earth, so it was easy for the police to requisition the security tapes and check them. There were plenty of punters on the floor that afternoon, but none of them was Kirsten Stevens. The grieving widow had lied about her whereabouts. That elevated her to the top of the suspect list. In fact, she was the only name on it. The evidence built up quickly after that. Questioning neighbors, detectives heard of the frequent screaming matches between Charlie and Kirsten, usually over money. They learned of Kirsten's affair. They found out about the insurance policy, giving her a million motives for murder. Then there were those incriminating internet searches and the final piece of the jigsaw, a 22 caliber rifle, found concealed behind a jacuzzi inside the couple's house. It had recently been fired and ballistics tests would flag it as the murder weapon. Why would you not get rid of the gun? What? Kirsten claimed that she had never seen the gun in her life. How then did her DNA end up on the trigger guard? Wow, she did not think any of this through. None. This was a dream case for any prosecutor, the kind where several separate strands of evidence intersect, where motive and opportunity are firmly established, where the murder weapon is in the hands of the authorities. Faced with such formidable odds, any sensible defendant would have begged for a deal, but not Kirsten. A gambler at heart, she decided to take one last roll of the dice. At her 2016 trial, she entered a not guilty plea to the charge of first-degree murder. Kirsten Stevens had never had much joy at the slots, and her run of ill fortune would continue with the jury. Found guilty of all charges, she was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. The only gambling she'll be doing in the future is small stakes poker with her fellow inmates. His ex-wife has to wonder, like, was it worth it? Obviously not. You've lost your life. What? Oh, my God. And the kids, the poor kids. He has like three or four kids. Good God. Wow. Okay. Let's read one more. This one's a little longer. It is Tanya Lane. In 2007, in the small town of Maitland, New South Wales, Australia, Stephen Choir and Renee Burns were living a humdrum suburban life. The couple in their late 20s had been cohabitating for several years. They had a daughter together and another child who was from an earlier relationship Renee had been involved in. Stephen, though, made no distinction between the girls. He doted on both of them equally, and then they apparently were devoted to him. As for his relationship with Renee, that was another matter. Things had become somewhat strained over the years. Neighbors frequently heard them arguing. Enter into this picture of domestic discord a young woman named Tanya Lane. Tanya was 23 years old and involved with Stephen's sister, Amanda. That was how she met Stephen and Renee, but she continued to visit them even after she and Amanda split up. In Renee, she found a compassionate friend, a shoulder to cry on, a sympathetic ear. Renee responded with her own horror stories from the relationship trenches, and that served to firm up the bond between the women. Soon, their friendship had evolved into something more intense. They became lovers. Ooh. For Tanya, this was much more than a fling, far from just a a conquest. She genuinely cared for Renee and believed that she might be in love with her. Renee felt the same way, but was rather more circumspect, insisting on discretion from the get-go. She had her kids to think of. And so the lovers developed a system for maintaining secrecy, 
a scheme that included a pair of cell phones purchased specifically for their interpersonal exchanges. This was exciting at first, but soon Tanya was pushing for more, encouraging Renee to leave Stephen and move in with her. The answer was the same as it had always been. There were the girls to consider and the girls loved Stephen. She would not take that away from them. This response undoubtedly frustrated Tanya, so much so that she decided to take matters into her own hands. Just before Christmas 2008, she phoned Stephen and asked if he would meet with her to discuss something. Intrigued, Stephen agreed. On the evening of December 23rd, he invited Tanya to the house. She, however, insisted that she wanted to talk privately and suggested that they go for a walk. Even more interested now, Stephen accompanied her on a moonlight ramble that took them away from the houses. Tanya was still making small talk, yet to get to the crux of the matter when a van suddenly appeared out of nowhere, its headlights off. The vehicle veered towards them and a man jumped out holding a gun. Stephen immediately threw up his hands, but his act of surrender did no good. Without so much as a warning, the man fired. The bullet, fired at short range, struck Stephen Quire in the head and spilled him into the dirt. The shooter, meanwhile, hustled Tanya into the van and raced away into the night with her. At this point, the young woman's fate looked dire. However, the gunman did not follow through with the abduction. Just a couple of blocks down the road, he pulled over and ordered Tanya from the vehicle. She would later have difficulty describing either the assailant or his van to the police. The man was wearing a baklava, she said, and she'd been so panicked that she'd taken almost nothing in. It was all a blur. Is that, I think I said that wrong, a balaclava? I said baklava, that's the dessert. A balaclava, is that how you put it? So a mask, he was wearing a mask. It was somewhat of a blur to Stephen too. He could remember nothing after seeing the muzzle flash from the gun. Fortunately, the shooter's aim had been off. The bullet had carved an ugly groove through his scalp, but it hadn't penetrated the skull cavity. Stephen Quire had had a very lucky escape. But if Stephen thought this brush with death would earn him any compassion from his partner, Renee, he was sorely mistaken, really. Renee was not only unsympathetic, she was callous and uncaring in her attitude toward him. As their relationship continued to deteriorate, Renee was turning more and more frequently to her friend, Tanya, for support. And friend is in quotes because we know they're lovers, right? In fact, Tanya visited so often that tongues were wagging in the neighborhood. People need to stay in their lane and mind their business. Seriously. If Stephen heard any of the rumors, he ignored them. He would continue to do so oh, oh, until one day in January 2010 when he arrived home early from work and caught Tanya and Renee in bed together. Ah! Oh my, my. Now finally it all made sense. Renee's coldness towards him, her secretive behavior, Tanya's ubiquitous presence, presence in their lives. Even the attempt on his life was explained now, right? Above all, it was Tanya who had lured him from the house, Tanya who had directed him to the remote location, Tanya who had somehow escaped the gunman without so much as a scratch. The more he thought about it, the more he became convinced that she had set him up and lured him into a trap. Either way, it was over now. Tanya was manhandled out of the door and warned never to return or to contact Renee again. We know this is not it though, right? It is difficult to comprehend what Stephen Choir must have been thinking and feeling at this time. Infidelity in relationships is hardly unusual. Many couples work through the difficulties and get their lives back on track. In some cases, such tribulation even makes them stronger. But Stephen's relationship with Renee seems to have been broken even before Tanya showed up, perhaps irreparably so. This might have been a good time to evaluate, to cut losses, to walk away. Instead, Stephen made one last desperate effort to hold on to the woman he still loved, and it would end up costing him his life. In mid-February 2010, Stephen Choir mysteriously and inexplicably disappeared. 
His common-law wife, Renee Burns, seemed unperturbed by his vanishing. She didn't bother reporting him missing to the police and offered only glib answers when Stephen's friends and family inquired about his whereabouts. How? I don't know how you, like, no, no. By late February, she had moved out of the house they shared and moved in with her lover, Tanya Lane, bringing her children with her. Tanya had her own explanation for Stephen's disappearance. She suggested that he had been killed by a local motorcycle gang over a drug deal gone bad. That explanation seemed like a distinct possibility when Stevens' decomposed remains were found in a national park near an area called Freeman's Waterhole in early March 2010. But there was perhaps a more likely explanation for Stephen Quire's death. Investigators soon heard about the incendiary love triangle between him, his wife, and Tanya Lane. Then, as they continued probing, they learned that Lane had been shopping for a gun in the weeks before Stephen's disappearance. Eventually, they traced a man who had sold a weapon to her, a World War II-era flare gun, that had been modified to fire shotgun shells. Choir had been killed by a single shotgun blast to the chest. See, do people think that the police are not going to find this stuff out Arrested and charged with murder, Tanya Lane swore that she was innocent. However, she would undermine her claim entirely after she made a call from prison in which she admitted to a friend that she had killed Stephen Quire. And again, all calls in prison are recorded. All of these calls are recorded, of course, providing the prosecution with a powerful piece of evidence. Confronted with the recording, Lane eventually broke down and confessed. She said that she had gone to the choir residence on the night of February 20th, 2010. There she had encountered Stephen in the hallway and killed him with a single blast from her modified weapon. She had loaded up his body and driven him to Freeman's water hole where she had buried him in a shallow grave. Tanya Lane expressed no remorse for the brutal killing of an innocent man and would maintain that stance at trial. After pleading guilty, she was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison with parole eligibility in 17 years. Lane swore that she had acted alone in killing Stephen Choir and that Renee Burns had played no part in the murder. Even if that was true, Burns was still an accessory after the fact. Her involvement earned her a four-year jail term. Was it worth it? No. No, it was not. Um... No, get a divorce. Move in with your lover if that's what you want to do. Don't kill each other, please. People need to stop doing this stuff. All right, guys. Well, that was two stories of women who were really, really stupid. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing, and I will see you in my next video. Bye, guys.